The Punctiliousness of Don Sebastian by W. Somerset Maugham This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For further information, or to volunteer, please go to LibriVox.org. Siormeneth is the most inaccessible place in Spain. Only one train arrives there in the course of the day, and that arrives at two o'clock in the morning. Only one train leaves it, and that starts an hour before sunrise. No one has ever been able to discover what happens to the railway officials during the intermediate one and twenty hours. A German painter I met there who had come by the only train, and had been endeavouring for a fortnight to get up in time to go away, told me that he had frequently gone to the station in order to clear up the mystery, but had never been able to do so. Yet, from his inquiries, he was inclined to suspect, and that was as far as he would commit himself, being a cautious man, that they spent the time in eating garlic and smoking execrable cigarettes. The guide-books tell you that Ziormeneth possesses the eyebrows of Joseph of Arimathea, a cathedral of the greatest quaintness, and battlements untouched since their erection in the fourteenth century, and they strongly advise you to visit it, but recommend you, before doing so, to add Keating's insect powder to your other toilet necessaries. I was travelling to Madrid in an express train which had been rushing along at the pace of sixteen miles an hour, when suddenly it stopped. I leant out of the window, asking where we were. Ziormeneth, answered the guard. I thought we did not stop at Ziormeneth. We do not stop at Ziormeneth, he replied impassively. But we are stopping now. That may be, but we are going on again. I had already learnt that it was folly to argue with the Spanish guard, and drawing back my head, I sat down but looking at my watch I saw that it was only ten. I should never again have a chance of inspecting the eyebrows of Joseph of Arimathea, unless I chartered a special train. So, seizing the opportunity and my bag, I jumped out. The only porter told me that everyone in Ziormaneth was asleep at that hour, and recommended me to spend the night in the waiting-room. But I bribed him heavily. I offered him two pesetas, which is nearly fifteen pence, and leaving the train to its own devices, he shouldered my bag and started off. Along a stony road we walked into the dark night, the wind blowing cold and bitter, and the clouds chasing one another across the sky. In front I could see nothing but the porter, hurrying along, bent down under the weight of my bag, and the wind blew icily. I buttoned up my coat, and then I regretted the warmth of the carriage, the comfort of my corner and my rug. I wished I had peacefully continued my journey to Madrid. I was on the verge of turning back, as I heard the whistling of the train. I hesitated, but the porter hurried on, and fearing to lose him in the night, I sprang forwards. Then the puffing of the engine, and on the smoke the bright reflection of the furnace, and the train steamed away. Like Abdel Rahman, I felt that I had flung my scabbard into the flames. Still the porter hurried on, bent down under the weight of my bag, and I saw no light in front of me to announce the approach to a town. On each side bordering the road were trees, and beyond them darkness, and great black clouds hastened after one another across the heavens. Then, as we walked along, we came to a rough stone cross, and lying on the steps before it was a woman with uplifted hands, and the wind blew bitter and keen, freezing the marrow of one's bones. What prayers had she to offer that she must kneel there alone in the night? We passed another cross, standing up with its outstretched arms like a soul in pain. At last a heavier night rose before me, and presently I saw a great stone arch, Passing beneath it, I found myself immediately in the town. The street was tortuous and narrow, paved with rough cobbles, and it rose steeply, so that the porter bent lower beneath his burden, panting. With the bag on his shoulders, he looked like some hunched-back gnome, a creature of nightmare. 
On either side rose tall houses, lying crooked and irregular, leaning towards one another at the top, so that one could not see the clouds, and their windows were great black apertures like giant mouths. There was not a light, not a soul, not a sound, except that of my own feet and the heavy panting of the porter. We wound through streets, round corners, through low arches, a long way up the steep cobbles, and suddenly down broken steps. They hurt my feet, and I stumbled and almost fell. But the hunchback walked along nimbly, hurrying ever. Then we came into an open space, and the wind caught us again, and blew through our clothes, so that I shrank up, shivering, and never a soul did we see as we walked on. It might have been a city of the dead. Then passed a tall church. I saw a carved porch, and from the side grim devils grinning down upon me. The porter dived through an arch, and I groped my way along a narrow passage. At length he stopped, and with a sigh threw down the bag. He beat with his fists upon an iron door, making the metal ring. A window above was thrown open, and a voice cried out. The porter answered. There was a clattering down the stairs, an unlocking, and the door was timidly held open, so that I saw a woman, with the light of her candle throwing a strange yellow glare on her face. And so I arrived at the hotel of Zyrmaneth. 2. My night was troubled by the ghostly crying of the watchman. "'Protect us, Mary, Queen of Heaven, protect us, Mary!' Every hour it rang out stridently, as soon as the heavy bells of the cathedral had ceased their clanging, and I thought of the woman kneeling at the cross, and wondered if her soul had found peace. In the morning I threw open the windows, and the sun came dancing in, flooding the room with gold. In front of me the great wall of the cathedral stood grim and grey, and the gargoyles looked savagely across the square. The cathedral is admirable. When you enter, you find yourself at once in darkness, and the air is heavy with incense. But as your eyes become accustomed to the gloom, you see the black forms of penitents, kneeling by pillars, looking towards an altar, and by the light of the painted windows, Hererodos, with the gaunt saints of an early painter, and aureoles shining dimly. But the gem of the cathedral of Ziormaneth is the chapel of the Duc de Lossus, containing, as it does, the alabaster monument of Don Sebastian Emmanuel de Mantona, Duc de Lossus, and of the very illustrious Signora Doña Sodina de Beraguet, his wife. Like everything else in Spain, the chapel is kept locked up, and the guide-book tells you to apply to the porter at the palace of the present Duke. I sent a little boy to fetch that worthy, who presently came back, announcing that the porter and his wife had gone into the country for the day, but that the Duke was coming in person. And immediately I saw walking towards me a little dark man, wrapped up in a big cape, with the red and blue velvet of the lining flung gaudily over his shoulder. He bowed courteously as he approached, and I perceived that on the crown his hair was somewhat more than thin. I hesitated a little, rather awkwardly, for the guide-book said that the porter exacted a fee of one peseta for opening the chapel. One could scarcely offer sevenpence halfpenny to a duke, but he quickly put an end to all doubts, for as he unlocked the door he turned to me and said, "'The fee is one franc.' As I gave it him, he put it in his pocket, and gravely handed me a little printed receipt. Baidecker had obligingly informed me that the Duchy of Lossas was shorn of its splendour, but I had not understood that the present representative added to his income by exhibiting the bones of his ancestors at a franc a head. We entered, and the Duke pointed out the groining on the roof and the tracery of the windows. "'This chapel contains some of the finest Gothic in Spain,' he said. When he considered that I had sufficiently admired the architecture, he turned to the pictures, and with the fluency of a professional guide, gave me their subjects and the names of the artists. Now we come to the tombs of Don Sebastian, the first Duke of Losas, and his spouse, Doña Sodina, not, however, the first Duchess. 
The monument stood in the middle of the chapel, covered with a great pall of red velvet, so that no economical tourist should see it through the bars of the gate, and thus save his peseta. The duke removed the covering, and watched me silently, a slight smile trembling below his little black moustache. The duke and his wife, who was not his duchess, lay side by side on a bed of carved alabaster. At the corners were four twisted pillars, covered with little leaves and flowers, and between them bas-reliefs, representing love and youth and strength and pleasure, as if, even in the midst of death, death must be forgotten. Don Sebastian was in full armour. His helmet was admirably carved, with a representation of the battle between the centaurs and the lapidae. On the right armpiece were portrayed the adventures of Venus and Mars, and on the left the emotions of Vulcan. But on the breastplate was an elaborate crucifixion, with soldiers and women and apostles. The visor was raised, and showed a stern, heavy face, with prominent cheekbones, sensual lips, and a massive chin. "'It is very fine,' I remarked, thinking the Duke expected some remark. "'People have thought so for three hundred years,' he replied gravely. He pointed out to me the hands of Don Sebastian. "'The guide-books have said that they are the finest hands in Spain. Tourists especially admire the tendons and the veins, which, as you perceive, stand out as in no human hand would be possible.' They say it is the summit of art. And he took me to the other side of the monument, that I might look at Doña Sodina. They say she was the most beautiful woman of her day, he said, but in that case the Castilian lady is the only thing in Spain which has not degenerated. She was indeed not beautiful. Her face was fat and broad like her husband's a short, ungraceful nose, and a little knobbly chin, a thick neck, set dumpily on her marble shoulders. One could not but hope that the artist had done her an injustice. The Duke of Lossus made me observe the dog which was lying at her feet. "'It is a symbol of fidelity,' he said. The guide-book told me she was chaste and faithful. "'If she had been,' he replied, smiling, Don Sebastian would perhaps never have become Duke de Losas. Really? It is an old history which I discovered one day among some family papers. I pricked up my ears, and discreetly began to question him. Are you interested in old manuscripts? said the Duke. Come with me, and I will show you what I have. With a flourish of the hand he waved me out of the chapel and having carefully locked the doors, accompanied me to his palace. He took me into a Gothic chamber, furnished with worn French furniture, the walls covered with cheap paper. Offering me a cigarette, he opened a drawer, and produced a faded manuscript. "'This is the document in question,' he said. "'Those crooked and fantastic characters are terrible. I often wonder if the writers were able to read them.' "'You are fortunate to be the possessor of such things,' I remarked. He shrugged his shoulders. "'What good are they? I would sooner have fifty pesetas than this musty parchment. An offer? I quickly reckoned it out in English money. He would doubtless have taken less, but I felt a certain delicacy in bargaining with a duke over his family secrets. "'Do you mean it? May I—' uh... He sprang towards me. "'I take it, my dear sir, take it. Shall I give you a receipt?' And so, for thirty-one shillings and threepence, I obtained the only authentic account of how the frailty of the illustrious Signora Doña Sodina was indirectly the means of raising her husband to the highest dignities in Spain. 3. Don Sebastian and his wife had lived together for fifteen years, with the entirest happiness to themselves, and the greatest admiration of their neighbours. People said that such an example of conjugal felicity was not often seen in those degenerate days, for even then they prated of the golden age of their grandfathers, lamenting their own decadence. As behoved good Castilians, burdened with such a line of noble ancestors, 
the fortunate couple conducted themselves with all imaginable gravity. No strange eye was permitted to witness a caress between the lord and his lady, or to hear an expression of endearment. But every one could see the devotion of Don Sebastian, the look of adoration which filled his eyes when he gazed upon his wife, and people said that Doña Sodina was worthy of all his affection. They said that her virtue was only matched by her piety, and her piety was patent to the whole world, for every day she went to the cathedral at Ziormane, and remained long immersed in her devotions. Her charity was exemplary, and no beggar ever applied to her in vain. But even if Don Sebastian and his wife had not possessed these conjugal virtues, they would have been, in Ziormaneth, persons of note, since not only did they belong to an old and respected family, which was rich as well, but the gentleman's brother was Archbishop of the Sea, who, when he graced the cathedral city with his presence, paid the greatest attention to Don Sebastian and Doña Sodina. Every one said that the Archbishop Pablo would shortly become a cardinal, for he was a great favourite with the king, and with the latter his holiness the Pope was then on terms of quite unusual friendship. And in those days, when the priesthood was more noticeable for its gallantry than for its good works, it was refreshing to find so high-placed a dignitary of the Church a pattern of Christian virtues, who, notwithstanding his gorgeous habit of life, his retinue, his palaces, recalled by his freedom from at least two of the seven deadly sins the simplicity of the apostles, which the common people have often supposed the perfect state of the minister of God. Don Sebastian had been affianced to Doña Sodina when he was a boy of ten, and before she could properly pronounce the viperish sibilance of her native tongue. When the lady attained her sixteenth year, the pair were solemnly espoused, and the young priest Pablo, the bridegroom's brother, assisted at the ceremony. In these days the union would have been instanced as a triumphant example of the success of the mariage de convenance, but at that time such arrangements were so usual that it never occurred to any one to argue for or against them. Yet it was not customary for a young man of two-and-twenty to fall madly in love with the bride whom he saw for the first time a day or two before his marriage, and it was still less customary for the bride to give back an equal affection. For fifteen years the couple lived in harmony and contentment, with nothing to trouble the even tenor of their lives, and if there was a cloud in their sky, it was that a kindly providence had vouchsafed no fruit to the union, notwithstanding the prayers and candles which Doña Sodina was known to have offered at the shrine of more than one saint in Spain, who had made that kind of miracle particularly his own. But even felicitous marriages cannot last for ever, since if the love does not lie, the lovers do. And so it came to pass that Doña Sodina, having eaten excessively of pickled shrimps, which the abbess of a highly respected convent had assured her were of great efficacy in the begetting of children, took a fever of the stomach, as the chronicle inelegantly puts it, and after a week of suffering was called to the other world, from which, as from the pickled shrimps, she had always expected much. There let us hope her virtues have been rewarded, and she rests in peace and happiness. 4. When Don Sebastian walked from the cathedral to his house, after the burial of his wife, no one saw a trace of emotion on his face, and it was with his wonted grave courtesy that he bowed to a friend as he passed him. Sternly and briefly as usual, he gave orders that no one should disturb him, and went to the room of Doña Sodina. He knelt on the praying-stool which Doña Sodina had daily used for so many years, and he fixed his eyes on the crucifix hanging on the wall above it. The day passed, and the night passed, and Don Sebastian never moved. No thought or emotion entered him. Being alive, he was like the dead. He was like the dead that linger on the outer limits of hell with never a hope for the future, dull with the despair that shall last for ever and ever and ever. But when the woman who had nursed him in his childhood, 
lovingly disobeyed his order, and entered to give him food. She saw no tear in his eye, no sign of weeping. "'You are right,' he said, painfully rising from his knees. "'Give me to eat.' Listlessly taking the food, he sank into a chair, and looked at the bed on which had lately rested the corpse of Doña Sodina. But a kindly nature relieved his unhappiness, and he fell into a weary sleep. When he awoke, the night was far advanced. The house, the town, were filled with silence. All round him was darkness, and the ivory crucifix shone dimly, dimly. Outside the door a page was sleeping. He woke him, and bade him bring light. In his sorrow, Don Sebastian began to look at the things his wife had loved. He fingered her rosary and turned over the pages of the half-dozen pious books which formed her library. He looked at the jewels which he had seen glittering on her bosom, the brocades, the rich silks, the cloths of gold and silver that she had delighted to wear. And at last he came across an old breviary, which he thought she had lost. How glad she would have been to find it! She had so often regretted it. The pages were musty with their long concealment, and only faintly could be detected the scent which Doña Sardina used yearly to make and strew about her things. Turning over the pages listlessly, he saw some crabbed writing. He took it to the light. "'Tonight, my beloved, I come.' And the handwriting was that of Pablo, Archbishop of Jimenez. Don Sebastian looked at it long. Why should his brother write such words in the breviary of Doña Sodina? He turned the pages, and the handwriting of his wife met his eye, and the words were the same. Tonight, my beloved, I come. As if they were such delight to her that she must write them herself. The breviary dropped from Don Sebastian's hand. The taper, flickering in the draught, threw glaring lights on Don Sebastian's face, but it showed no change in it. He sat looking at the fallen breviary, and in his mind at the love which was dead. At last he passed his hand over his forehead. "'And yet,' he whispered, "'I loved thee well.' But as the day came, he picked up the breviary and locked it in a casket. He knelt again at the praying-stool, and, lifting his hands to the crucifix, prayed silently. Then he locked the door of Doña Sardina's room, and it was a year before he entered it again. That day the Archbishop Pablo came to his brother to offer consolation for his loss, and Don Sebastian, at the parting, kissed him on either cheek. Five. The people of Ziormeneth said that Don Sebastian was heartbroken, for from the date of his wife's interment he was not seen in the streets by day. A few returning home from some riot had met him wandering in the dead of night, but he passed them silently by. But he sent his servants to Toledo and to Burgos, to Salamanca, Cordoba, even to Paris and Rome and from all these places they brought him books, and day after day he studied in them, till the common folk asked if he had turned magician. So passed eleven months, and nearly twelve, till it wanted but five days to the anniversary of the death of Doña Sodina. Then Don Sebastian wrote to his brother the letter which for months he had turned over in his mind. Seeing the instability of all human things, and the uncertain length of our exile upon earth, I have considered that it is evil for brothers to remain so separate. Therefore I implore you, who are my only relative in this world, and heir to all my goods and estates, to visit me quickly. For I have a presentiment that death is not far off, and I would see you before we are parted by the immense sea. The archbishop was thinking that he must shortly pay a visit to his cathedral city, and, as his brother had desired, came to Zormaneth immediately. On the anniversary of Doña Sodina's interment, 
Don Sebastian entertained Archbishop Pablo to supper. "'My brother,' said he to his guest, "'I have lately received from Cordova a wine which I desire you to taste. It is very highly prized in Africa, whence I am told it comes, and is made with curious art and labour. Glass cups were brought, and the wine poured. The archbishop was a connoisseur, and held it between the light and himself, admiring the sparkling clearness, and then inhaled the odour. "'It is nectar,' he said. At last he sipped it. "'The flavour is very strange.' He drank deeply. Don Sebastian looked at him, and smiled as his brother put down the empty glass. But when he was himself about to drink, the cup fell between his hands and the steward's, breaking into a hundred fragments, and the wine spilt on the floor. "'Fool!' cried Don Sebastian, and in his anger struck the servant. But, being a man of peace, the archbishop interposed. "'Do not be angry with him. It was an accident.' "'There is more wine in the flagon.' "'No, I will not drink it,' said Don Sebastian wrathfully. "'I will drink no more to-night.' The archbishop shrugged his shoulders. When they were alone, Don Sebastian made a strange request. "'My brother, it is a year to-day that Sodina was buried, and I have not entered her room since then. But now I have a desire to see it. Will you come with me?' The archbishop consented and together they crossed the long corridor that lent to Doña Sodina's apartment, preceded by a boy with lights. Don Sebastian unlocked the door, and, taking the taper from the page's hand, entered. The archbishop followed. The air was chill and musty, and even now an odour of recent death seemed to pervade the room. Don Sebastian went to a casket, and from it took a breviary. He saw his brother start as his eye fell on it. He turned over the leaves till he came to a page on which was the archbishop's handwriting, and handed it to him. "'Oh, God!' exclaimed the priest, and looked quickly at the door. Don Sebastian was standing in front of it. He opened his mouth to cry out, but Don Sebastian interrupted him. "'Do not be afraid. I will not touch you. For a while they looked at one another silently, one pale, sweating with terror, the other calm and grave as usual. At last Don Sebastian spoke hoarsely. "'Did she—did she love you?' "'Oh, my brother, forgive her. It was long ago, and she repented bitterly. And I—' uh, uh, "'I have forgiven you.' The words were said so strangely that the archbishop shuddered. What did he mean? Don Sebastian smiled. You have no cause for anxiety. From now it is finished. I will forget. And opening the door, he helped his brother across the threshold. The archbishop's hand was clammy as a hand of death. When Don Sebastian bade his brother good night, he kissed him on either cheek. Six. The priest returned to his palace, and when he was in bed, his secretary prepared to read to him, as was his wont, but the archbishop sent him away, desiring to be alone. He tried to think, but the wine he had drunk was heavy upon him, and he fell asleep. But presently he awoke, feeling thirsty. He drank some water. Then he became strangely wide awake. A feeling of uneasiness came over him, as of some threatening presence behind him, and again he felt the thirst. He stretched out his hand for the flagon, but now there was a mist before his eyes, and he could not see. His hand trembled so that he spilt the water, and the uneasiness was magnified till it became a terror, and the thirst was horrible. He opened his mouth to call out, but his throat was dry, so that no sound came. He tried to rise from his bed, but his limbs were heavy, and he could not move. He breathed quicker and quicker, and his skin was extraordinarily dry. The terror became an agony. It was unbearable. 
He wanted to bury his face in the pillows to hide it from him. He felt the hair on his head hard and dry, and it stood on end. He called to God for help, but no sound came from his mouth. Then the terror took shape and form, and he knew that behind him was standing Doña Sudina, and she was looking at him with terrible, reproachful eyes. And a second Doña Sodina came and stood at the end of the bed, and another came by her side, and the room was filled with them. And his thirst was horrible. He tried to moisten his mouth with spittle, but the source of it was dry. Cramps seized his limbs so that he writhed with pain. Presently a red glow fell upon the room, and it became hot and hotter till he gasped for breath. It blinded him, but he could not close his eyes, and he knew it was the glow of hell-fire, for in his ears rang the groans of souls in torment, and among the voices he recognised that of Doña Sodina, and then, then he heard his own voice, and in the livid heat he saw himself in his episcopal robes lying on the ground, chained to Doña Sodina, hand and foot and he knew that as long as heaven and earth should last, the torment of hell would continue. When the priests came in to their master in the morning, they found him lying dead, with his eyes wide open, staring with a ghastly brilliancy into the unknown. Then there was weeping and lamentation, and from house to house the people told one another that the archbishop had died in his sleep. The bells were set tolling, and as Don Sebastian in his solitude heard them, referring to the chief ingredient of that strange wine from Cordova, he permitted himself the only jest of his life. It was Belladonna that sent his body to the worms, and it was Belladonna that sent his soul to hell. 7. The chronicle does not state whether the thought of his brother's heritage had ever entered Don Sebastian's head, but the fact remains that he was the sole heir, and the archbishop had gathered the loaves and fishes to such purpose during his life that his death made Don Sebastian one of the wealthiest men in Spain. The simplest actions in this world, O Martin Tupper, have often the most unforeseen results. Now Don Sebastian had always been ambitious, and his changed circumstances made him realise more clearly than ever that his merit was worthy of a brilliant arena. The times were propitious, for the old king had just died, and the new one had sent away the army of priests and monks, which had turned every day into a Sunday. People said that God Almighty had had his day, and that the heathen deities had come to rule in his stead. From all corners of Spain gallants were coming to enjoy the sunshine, and every one who could make a compliment or a graceful bow was sure of a welcome. So Don Sebastian prepared to go to Madrid, but before leaving his native town he thought well to appease a possibly vengeful providence by erecting in the cathedral a chapel in honour of his patron saint. Not that he thought the saints would trouble themselves about the death of his brother, even though the causes of it were not entirely natural. But Don Sebastian remembered that Pablo was an archbishop, and the fact caused him a certain anxiety. He called together architects and sculptors, and ordered them to erect an edifice befitting his dignity, and being a careful man, as all Spaniards are, thought he would serve himself as well as the saint, and bade the sculptors make an image of Doña Sodina, and an image of himself, in order that he might use the chapel also as a burial place. To pay for this, Don Sebastian left the revenue of several of his brother's farms, and then, with a peaceful conscience, set out for the capital. At Madrid he laid himself out to gain the favour of his sovereign, and by dint of unceasing flattery soon received much of the king's attention, and presently Philip deigned to ask his advice on petty matters. And since Don Sebastian took care to advise as he saw the king desired, the latter concluded that the courtier was a man of stamina and ability, and began to consult him on matters of state. Don Sebastian opined that the pleasure of the prince must always come before the welfare of the nation, and the king was so impressed with his sagacity that one day 
he asked his opinion on a question of precedence, to the indignation of the most famous councillors in the land. But the haughty soul of Don Sebastian chafed, because he was only one among many favourites. The court was full of flatterers as assiduous and as obsequious as himself. His proud Castilian blood could brook no companions. But one day, as he was moodily waiting in the royal antechamber, thinking of these things, it occurred to him that a certain profession had always been in great honour among princes, and he remembered that he had a cousin of eighteen who was being educated in a convent near the Ormaneth. She was beautiful. With buoyant heart he went to his house, and told his steward to fetch her from the convent at once. Within a fortnight she was at Madrid. Mercia was presented to the Queen in the presence of Philip, and Don Sebastian noticed that the royal eye lighted up as he gazed on the bashful maiden. Then all the proud Castilian had to do was to shut his eyes and allow the King to make his own opportunities. Within a week Mercia was created maid of honour to the Queen, and Don Sebastian was seized with an indisposition which confined him to his room. The King paid his court royally, which is boldly, and Doña Mercia had received in the convent too religious an education not to know that it was her duty to grant the King whatever it graciously pleased him to ask. When Don Sebastian recovered from his illness, he found the world at his feet, for every one was talking of the King's new mistress, and it was taken as a matter of course that her cousin and guardian should take a prominent part in the affairs of the country. But Don Sebastian was furious. He went to the King, and bitterly reproached him for thus dishonouring him. Philip was a humane and generous-minded man, and understood that, with a certain temperament, it might be annoying to have one's ward philander with the King. So he did his best to console the courtier. He called him his friend and brother. He told him he would always love him. But Don Sebastian would not be consoled, and nothing would comfort him except to be made High Admiral of the Fleet. Philip was charmed to settle the matter so simply, and as he delighted in generosity, when to be generous cost him nothing, he also created Don Sebastian Duke of Losas, and gave him, into the bargain, the hand of the richest heiress in Spain. And that is the end of the story of the punctiliousness of Don Sebastian. With his second wife he lived many years, beloved of his sovereign, courted by the world, honoured by all, till he was visited by the destroyer of delights and the leveller of the grandeur of this world. 8. Towards evening the Duke of Losas passed my hotel, and seeing me at the door, asked if I had read the manuscript. "'I thought it interesting,' I said, a little coldly, for of course I knew no Englishman would have acted like Don Sebastian. He shrugged his shoulders. "'It is not half so interesting as a good dinner.' At these words I felt bound to offer him such hospitality as the hotel afforded. I found him a very agreeable messmate. He told me the further history of his family— which nearly became extinct at the end of the last century, since the only son of the seventh duke had, unfortunately, not been born of any duchess. But Ferdinand, who was then king of Spain, was unwilling that an ancient family should die out, and was at the same time sorely in want of money. So the titles and honours of the house were continued to the son of the seventh duke, and King Ferdinand built himself another palace. But now— said my guest, mournfully shaking his head. "'It is finished. My palace and a few acres of barren rock are all that remain to me of the lands of my ancestors, and I am the last of the line.' But I bade him not despair. He was a bachelor, and a duke, and not yet forty. I advised him to go to the United States before they put a duty on foreign noblemen. This was before the war— and I recommended him to take Maida Vale and Manchester on his way. Personally, I gave him a letter of introduction to an heiress of my acquaintance at Hampstead, for even in these days it is not so bad a thing to be a Duchess of Losa, and the present Duke has no brother. End of The Punctiliousness of Don Sebastian 
by Somerset Maugham. Read by Termin Diane.